James, verily, verily, I say unto you. What is interesting is uh, John is the only one that really uh, takes this in the Gospel of John into a, a large teaching. 11 of 21 chapters, he's showing this unique teaching technique of Jesus called Amen, Amen. The Hebrew word for truly, truly is Amen, and that's actually what is used in the text. We have studied this. We're in, I, I don't know, fourth or fifth study on this. Another thing that's interesting about John's teaching on truly, truly, which is a, a messianic doctrine, John is showing you in the book, uh, I think there are 25 of these in the book of John. Truly, truly, I say unto you, there are 25 of them, 11 of 21 chapters. Uh, he records this, and he, he does a, a double. Now, normally in the Old Testament, these were, this amen was uh, uh, at the end of a doxology, and we've shown you many of those in the Old Testament. So when the, the amen the truly is not really, that's based on the veracity of God behind what's being taught. But the amen of it, there, every time you have an amen side, there's two sides to an amen of the Hebrew. There's a God side and a, and a believer side. On the God side, it, it mean, the, the part that means for that is it. It is so, it, it, it shall be, and is so, it is so, and it shall be. In other words, whatever is said, this, you, can, you can take this to the bank. This is the, the truthfulness of God speaking his sovereignty. On the, and then it's stated. And then whatever stated comes from God's teaching, comes from as an absolute truth to be believed in. And when a believer hears it and understands it, then his response is to be either silent or it shall be so. And that's what his, his response is. Uh, it shall be so. I've heard you, Father. I've heard exactly what you've told me. I've heard you. I believe it. I believe this is important to my life. So let it be so. So let it be so. This is the concept of amen. Now, in the Christian church, you hear people say amen a great deal uh, because they've probably been taught. If they haven't been taught, then once it's taught, then you certainly know that what something you've heard you believe to be an absolute truth uh, important to your life, and then you say amen, which says, I, I heard it, I understand it, I believe it for my life, so let it be for my life. So this is kind of important, and the other thing that John does, before I have my word of prayer, the other thing that John does in his book on truly, truly, I say unto you, and that's what we're studying through on in the book of John, is that sometimes he does them, I mean, sometimes you will find him only do it one time. Sometimes he'll do it three times or four times in context. And a good example of that is in chapter 5 of John, where we are today. When you look at the context of our lesson today, it goes from the fifth chapter, verse 1 through 30, um, maybe, yeah, 30, through 30. I mean, there are 30 verses in context. Three times he says, verily, verily, I say unto you in, that, in those 30 verses. And what's unique about John's 5 is he does them back to back. For example, notice in your, if you have your Bibles open to John 5, the first one is mentioned in verse 19. The next one is in verse 24 and then followed up in 25. Do you see that? And the context of that whole discussion is 30 verses. In that 30 verses, and half of those 30 verses is a story of the healing that Jesus did on the Sabbath. There's 30 verses in context. 15 of them are devoted to the healing. Verses 1 through 15, Jesus heals the man uh, at Passover festival uh, at the, the sheep's pool. 
at the temple. You remember the man who had, was an invalid for 38 years, uh, Jesus heals him, and that's on a Sabbath. Now, that's on a Sabbath holiday. So um, the Jews react to that in verses 16 through 18. The Jews react to it. They charge him. In fact, you remember we talked about the temple police gave the man a ticket for carrying his mat on the Sabbath after he was healed? Jesus said, pick up your mat, walk, right? Uh, the Jews turned around and charged Jesus with um, healing on the Sabbath, uh, telling a man to carry his mat on the Sabbath, and then charged him with uh, it, making himself equal with God. Now that's verses 16, 17, 18. So the Jews react to that. And so I call it a story within a story. The story we have comes out of two stories. When we finally get to what we're interested in, truly, truly, I say to you, verses 19, 24, and 25, and you can see that when he gets into 25, the one in verily, verily, he takes it all the way to verse 30, which is a long one. Notice that. Notice when he says verily in verse 24, then he follows up with verse 25, and, the, and 25 runs all the way to 30. Do you see that? Just flash through it. Okay. So this, it's kind of heavy, but you've got three truly, trulys. You've got three great messianic doctrines taught back to back over the story, the two stories, the healing and the response of the religious people to it, and then Jesus' response to, response, response to that. So uh, today we're looking at John 5.24 in the first hour. That's my lesson. We're looking at, he comes off from verse 19, which goes through 23, that that's his response. Notice in verse that Jesus answered truly, truly in verse 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the father doing. Remember that word seeing is blepo. And it means to see with a, with a naked eye, with, with, a, with the eyeball. Uh, kind of like you, you set and you witness something and then you're called to testify unless it is something he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, these things the Son does in like manner. He mimics. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. In other words, this is going to rock your world. When you see the Father open up greater works than you've just witnessed, He's going to raise the dead. He's going to heal the blind. He's going to do all of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 to show that he's the Messiah. And when you see all these things come to pass, they will be greater works than these. It will rock your world. When he says, you will marvel, it will rock Israel's world. The religious world of Israel will absolutely knock back on their heels just as they are being in this story. Then, and so, then, in, it, then he goes on, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even, which he just did with the invalid. He just did that. Listen, do you think the invalid's, invalid's uh, life, medically incurable, Disease? Do you think his life was changed? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know by what power his life was changed? By the power of the life, the divine life of Christ. For not even the Father judges anybody, but has given all judgment to the Son. The Father had judgment over the disease. He's going, to have, he's going to have power over death. He's going to have power over what would be called natural medical laws or natural laws of creation. He has power over them. 
he is able to bring judgment on him at a point. In order that all may honor, and why does he do this? In order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. For he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Then he comes to verse 24. See, all those two stories, this is the sto two stories behind the story in, that we're about to engage in, which is your story. I'm about to enter your life with truly, truly, I say unto you. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death and into life. There's three promises made there that we're going to talk about this morning. There's three promises made. I don't want you to miss it. But first, a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. You must study the Bible. You must learn it and live it by the power of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. It's called spiritual. Spirituality. And it is the message behind sanctification of our dispensation, the church. Confession of sin is, may be necessary if you're aware of carnality or personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, it could be sins of the tongue, it could be overt sins that should be confessed in privacy and pri prior through your priesthood prior to study. Why? Because you have to study the Bible under the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual truth. All of that will transform your life. It will transform you. It's not about being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of 1 John 1, 9 that says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And I pray that that be the procedure, the protocol to proper Bible study in the life of our people, both those who are with us today in the auditorium as well as those who are visiting with us by Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of eternal life to us today. Three promises made under verily, verily, I say unto you, three promises that come out of the veracity and sovereignty of God, spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, the second member of the Godhead, for the reality of that input into our life as we sat here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I took these three, based on the background of the stories, for three great doctrines. Equality with God, which I taught last time. I mean, what an enormous... They charged him with something that was absolutely true. They're going to take him to court on something that's absolutely true. And because it is absolutely true, they're when they take him to court, they're going to have to have false witnesses bring charges against him because the truth would set him free. Just like, in, like he told it would do in your life in John 8.32, you will know the truth and it will set you free. If they had went to court and told the truth, it would set him free. But he's got to go to the cross. And so they have to, listen, they, because he is the epitome of absolute truth, they have to bring false witnesses. They have to pay him off. A corrupt governing system who has already thrown God under the bus and now are about to throw his son. Hello, America. Hello, America. So we're going to talk about the second one, eternal life today. I want to ask you a question. Suppose a friend walks up to you and says, and, and probably this has happened to you, I have some good news and some bad news. Which do you want first? You ever had anybody do that to you? Probably. I know you've heard it enough to know that other people have had it to them. How do you think when that is said to you? What goes through your mind? 
I have some good news and some bad news. Which you want first? What goes through your mind as a, as a mature believer? Let me ask you this. Do you think there's no such thing as bad news to a spiritual mature believer because of Romans 8.28? That should be 8.28, not 8.29 on your paper. Is, is that your first response? It ought to be if you're a spiritual mature believer because there is no such thing as bad news. There is no such thing thing if you believe in Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his, his pur purposed will for your life. If you believe that, there's no such thing as bad news. And so your response ought to be, there is no such thing as bad news, so you decide what, what's easy for you. Would that be a fair because it gives you a chance to witness to somebody who thinks there's good news and bad news. But for a spiritual mature believer that understands Romans 8.28, along with other passages of Scripture, there is no such thing as bad news in the Christian life. It's a false concept to mislead you, to pull you. That's conformity to the world, not transformity of the Word of God. Eternal life is all about that concept. When we talk about eternal life, people think about dying and going to heaven. That's okay because that is true. Eternal life is the life of God. Eternal life is the life of God actively working in your life. I don't know what you think eternal life is. But it's made up of two separate words. Eternal life is not one Greek word. It's two Greek words. And they're separate words to describe something. Eternal life. Iodos zeo, or zoe. When you talk about eternal life and attach it to God, there is no beginning and no end. I had a professor at Sanford. She taught English. Can't remember her name. Kurt might remember. But I can't remember her name, but she was there. For, got off with a Mayflower or somebody. She, <laughs> but the first day of class, she would take up, she would, on the blackboard, we had blackboards show you how long ago I went to school. We had blackboards. She took a, a, a chalk, and she says, I'm not permitted to write on the walls, or I would. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to draw a line. And she drew a line all the way around that blackboard, off that, and she said, I want you to imagine that that line goes on, but of course I'm not permitted to do that. But I want you to know that, that is the life of God. Then she put a dot, a little dot in that line. And she said, that's your life. Now, if you want to travel with that line from, its from whatever its origin is, which we don't even talk about a beginning or an end, you're, when you drop in on that, let me tell you how you get in that that puts you part of that whole system. You, and then she went through the gospel. You've got to believe that Jesus came into this world as the Son of God. He went into that line. That dot is Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, you're into that line called eternal life, divine life of God. And she went through the gospel on my first day of class, and I went, boy, am I in the right school. She was an English teacher. Do you know I never had one theological professor ever do that? I guess he assumed that all of us in there uh, were saved. But boy, was he wrong. But that lady did. 
She got every person on that first day of school. And she taught that that dot on that line is Jesus Christ. The only person that could ever be on that line is Jesus Christ. But in Christ, we're all on that line. That line's eternal life. And she went through the gospel. You got to believe that Jesus came into the world, died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. If you believe it, because Christ is on that line, in Christ you have eternal life. And she read 1 John 5, 11 through 13. It changed my life. Now, I was already saved. It changed. It, it, it dropped me into transformational thinking. I thought, wow, was that a good was that a good one? And I never forgot that, that great big line and that little dot. And I could, and that little dot represented Jesus Christ, the, the, the physical manifestation of eternal life. And when you believe him, you are in him, you are on that line, you are on that, you are on, if you're on that line, you're in that life. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. When we talk about eternal life, we're talking about something that is all God, eternal life. It's eternal and it's life. It's not human life. It's God's life in human. It's God's life in you. Jesus nailed it in John 10.10 10 when he referred to eternal life as the abundant life. How about that? I mean, we have the life of God in us through Jesus Christ. We have the life of God. It's called eternal life. For us, it has a beginning, but no ending. But once we enter into salvation in Christ and that eternal life, we enter into that, we are part of something. Though it has a beginning and has no end, it attaches to something that had no beginning. Did you hear what I just said? I know I'm not trying to be philosophical here. I'm just telling you what, how it is. The moment you enter into Christ, you enter into a line that has no beginning and has no end. Now, we understand eternal life has a beginning and no end. But what you may not understand is that once you're in Christ, then you are attached to that no beginning and no end. Well, let me, let me show you how he could say it. Let me show you. Go, go to Galatians just a moment, and then I'll get in my study. In Galatians, the third chapter, show you what I'm talking about. Because your heritage is behind you. Your spiritual heritage is behind you. It's on that line. In the third chapter... He says in verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's that dot on the line. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. Now watch what he does. He connects you to the spiritual paths in Christ. He, he connects you to the genealogy of Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. Listen to this. For if you belong to Christ, that dot on the line, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs to promise. Do you understand that? Listen, he just connected you to the spiritual heritage that takes you in Christ, takes you all the way back to Adam. If you read Luke 3rd chapter... Verse 23 through 38. Think about that. And if you read Luke 3, 23 through 38, when you get down to 38, you get all the way back to God. You go through this chain of spiritual people all the way back to God. And when you get to God, you're into no beginning. You understand that? 
That's pretty powerful. In other words, from Christ, I go all the way back to God, and in God, it makes my endless life, eternal life, understandable. Eternal. Where does eternal come from? It comes from God. It's part of the character of God. Eternal is part of the character of God. I enter into this life through Jesus Christ, but I go all the way back to God where it began. And when, I, when I'm there, I'm in what is no beginning and no ending. <laughs> I don't know. Story behind the story, we talked about the healing of the man. The second story, the religious uh, legalist attacking Jesus for healing a man on the Sabbath and making himself equal with God. A doctrinal principle that's really important for you to understand because this is how got the religious men all screwy. False assumptions lead to false interpretations, lead to false expectations, lead to false applications. You can see it in the Pharisees. Jesus responded to these false charges with three Hebrew amen doctrines called truly, truly, I say to you. 19, 24, and 25. Last week, we looked at the amen doctrine of equality with God. This week, we're going to look at three things about the eternal life. The amen doctrine of eternal life. That's the principle of truly, truly. When you study the book of John, both John's writing and gospel of John and 1 John, John becomes the premier writer on the subject of eternal life. He writes it in both the Gospel of John, which is, he's heavy in it, as well as in 1 John, probably the most, most quoted on eternal life is 1 John 5, 11 through 13, if any man be in Christ. I mean, eternal life is in Jesus. If you're in Jesus, you have eternal life. That's probably the most famous. And part of that most famous line is, how do I know that? I mean, people say to me, well, Rod, that sounds good, but how do I know that's true? Well, the only, only answer is what John gave us in 1 John 5.13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, so that you may know, written so that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you know you have eternal life? Not because it's based on a feeling. It's based on an absolute truth. It's what's, it's a, it's what's been written. It's not how you feel. It's what God has promised you. It's based on the word of God. Man, if we based on how we feel, uh, we, it would be up for grabs every day. And by everybody... That's experiencing the ups and downs of life. Thank goodness that's not based on that. So let's look at this. First of all, let's go and take a look at, at John 5, 24. I said, you, I said to you there are three promises, and that's point one. In this amen doctrine of eternal life, there are three promises made to us in verse 24. Let me get back to John. Well, it's right there on the top of your paper, but I, I, I love... I love looking at my Bible. I'm a book guy. I don't like seeing this stuff. I'm, I'm a book guy, so I, I, I don't like seeing it anywhere but in the book. He says, truly, truly, I say, I'm from the New American Standard. Truly, truly, I say to you, there, there's our big doc, messianic doctrine. He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. I'm going to stop right there. Look, I broke this thing down into three promises. Here's what he says. He says, he who hears that, see that hole on the front of that word on your paper? That's a definite article. And it should be translated, the one who. That's a definite article. That's an articulate participle. And it means the one who, or whosoever. You know, the old King James would say, whosoever believes. That's it. The one who, or whosoever, he who hears, a kuo, means to hear, to understand. He who hears to understand my words and believes on him who sent me, Jesus says, has eternal life. That's the first promise. Now, I'm going to show you something. 
I'm going to show you something. You got a pencil? There's one in the pew if you don't have one. See, echo, the word has, is echo, present active indicative. I call it a main verb. See that? Yeah. Circle that thing says main verb. Circle the, it says main verb. Just circle main verb. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's important. Because the action of a present participle is going to occur at the same time as a present indicative. That's a, that's a, that's a principle of Greek grammar. The action of the main verb, the action of the participle, present participle, is going to occur at the same time as a present indicative. The present indicative is the main verb. Everything flows off of that. In other words, here's what the writer is saying. Here's what Jesus is saying. He is saying that if you want to have eternal life, two things have got to happen. You've got to hear to understand and believe that God sent Jesus as the source of eternal life. Because the main verb, having eternal life, is based on hearing and believing to, to receive it. It's a Greek principle. It's a standard. It's a, it's a, a first-year level understanding of the Greek. This is not complicated. Anybody who's taken first-year Greek could, could understand this. He who hears, present participle, my words, and believes, present participle, on him who sent me, has, main verb. If you do this, you got this. If you don't do those two things, you don't, you don't have this. But if you hear and understand and believe on him who sent me, and, and, and listen, what, look, look, and why did, listen to me now, why did God send Jesus? Well, you say, I know, you know, if I was downstairs teaching little kids, they'd lift up their hand because he's going to go to the cross and die and be buried and raised from the dead. I would say you're absolutely right. But upstairs, and that's probably what you thought, agreed? What if I said then, prove it, show me. Could you give me a scripture? Because without showing me a scripture, I want to know where it's written. Could you show me a scripture? where it says that you get eternal life, uh, it, it, he who hears and believes on him who sent me? It boils down to why did God send him? So I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you one. 1 John 4.10. I'm going to give you one. I'm going to, I'm going to give you one that fits. 4.10. 1 John 4.10. 410 is going to come back to the subject of John 3.16. Now, everybody knows John 3.16. You should remember 1 John 3.16 and then remember 1 John 4.10. Now, look at verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. He's talking about eternal life, life. In, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent, this is the second time we've heard this, and sent his son to be the propitiation or the supreme sacrifice for our sins. In other words, this is the sins that have us under judgment. These are the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. And the propitious work of Christ removes that judgment from us and gives us eternal life. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the sacrifice, the sacrificial offering. This is John 1.29, the Lamb of God that's come into the world to take away the, sins of, the sin of the world. This is, this is 1 Corinthians 5.7, Jesus Christ, the Passover Lamb, 
the Passover lamb, the blood on the doorpost that kept the death angel off. Come on. There's the first promise. And why is hearing the first? Hearing to believe. Listen, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. He doesn't say believe and hear. He says hear and believe. It's, it's about perception of truth. Here's the second promise out of John 5, 24. Here's the second promise. The second promise says, the person who believes, hears and believes, has eternal life. The person who has eternal life shall not come into condemnation. He puts this strong ook with this word, erkoomai, present, middle, indicative. That present, middle, indicative is running a second main verb off from hearing and believing. Hearing and believing, receiving eternal life. He runs a second one. This person is, is out of condemnation and can never be condemned for that sin ever. You understand? This is Romans 8.1. In Christ, there is no condemnation. And the moment you believe, 2 Corinthians 5 uh, 517, 2 Corinthians 517, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Listen, when you hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life. If you have eternal life, there's no more condemnation. There's your security passage. That's a security passage. And how did I get eternal life? If I have eternal life, I have no condemnation. There's no eternal condemnation. It's gone. It's gone. See, that's a second main verb wa wa working. In other words, everything the first part of that verse says now is brought into a second place of importance, no condemnation. In Christ, there's no condemnation. And how do I get in Christ? The moment I believe the gospel, I'm placed, I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, into a position of Christ that can never change. That's eternal life. Eternal life, I've entered into a system of life. Just like at, in physical birth, I am born into a natural system of life. I've bo been born again into a supernatural existence of life. A supernatural. Do you live the supernatural life? Or do you live conformity to the world? Because if you're living the supernatural life, you're living transformation. Romans 12, 2. Here's the third promise. Now watch what he does. He gives you a third main verb. The first ver main verb was in the first promise, have. Present active indicative. The second was no condemnation. He put it in present middle indicative because it's a deponent verb. Now he has passed, he has passed from death into life. It's the third indicative. Notice IND, that means indicative. That's the third in a row. That's a third main verb working off from. That's a that's a first promise that gives you a second promise that gives you a third promise. That's how I got the three promises. It's built into the Greek structure. But watch this one. The first two main verbs were present indicatives, not this one. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. This is a perfect indicative. Look at that on your paper. He is passed. That's a perfect active indicative. Let me tell you what the perfect tense in the Greek means. And listen, anybody can look this up. That's why I teach it the way I teach it. You can look this up. A perfect tense. Here's a perfect tense. Completed in the past with the results, it remains completed forever. Hoo-ah! Do you hear that? Now, I'm going to say it again. 
Here's the perfect tense. I'm not going to say who again, but I'm going to say, here's the perfect tense. Here's what it means in the Greek language. Because you can't see it in the English, but this is what it means. Completed in the past with the results, it remains completed forever. Now, what is that? Here it is. The person who hears and believes and enters has enters into the eternal life, and eternal life enters into that whole system, that whole system, that supernatural system of life, of transformation, is no longer under condemnation. Third, he has passed. With the result, he remains passed forever. From which is ek plus the lab, a, a, ablative of separation from spiritual death into spiritual life, eternal life. <laughs> that is, oh, people, that is so good. That is so good. I mean, that one verse, he just, I mean, that's bases loaded and a home run. Do I? There you go, whatever. All right. Now, how did we get into death? 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. There you have it. Passed out of death. I want to show it to you. It's one of my favorite verses. If you, if you hang around me, then you're going to learn this one. First, I'm in Colossians 1, 13, 14. Here it is, right? Here it is. I am passed. The moment I believe the gospel of Christ, I am passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life. I am passed out. That's a permanent pass, passing out. <laughs> That's a, I don't know why that sounds funny. I've got somebody, I got people laying all over the floor passed out. We're, we are passed, passed from one to uh, another. Uh, here I am in Colossians 1 3. Listen to this. For he delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For he delivered us, watch this now. Here we were in Adam. In Adam, we, in, we were in a sphere of darkness. Thirteen judicial charges over us. In Adam, we are spiritually dead. We are in spiritual darkness. You know those thirteen judicial charges. He says, and he delivered us. That's grace. He, Jesus Christ, delivered us from the reign of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. That's at salvation, and that's by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast. Delivered, rescued, rescued out of death, transferred into life. And once out of death and into life, you're into life, and life is into you forever. That's the perfect tense. Past, in the past, with the with the results, you remain that way forever. Here's the second thing. Wow, I'm not going to get through my lesson today. I thought I'd bust right through all this. I can't do two yet. It's time to take the offering. It's time to go have a cup of coffee and chat. What do you think, I came here to preach? Time to take a potty break, have a cup of coffee, and then come back. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for all that your grace has provided us. I'm thankful, Father, that we understand how to give. We give out of spiritual growth maturity. As we have purposed, as the Holy Spirit has led us, there are so many ways to give the things you've given us to others for ministry and for help. One of them here, Father, is to be able to give back into the church so the church can spend it in ways to support its ministry. I'm thankful for that. 
I, I pray today that we would be good stewards of what people uh, commit to us uh, as a leadership. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.